Mayo experience. Today, I'm not going to say how to win at betting on football, but actually how to bet on the NFL. A lot of people very confused about how to bet on the NFL. So the one thing that we're going to be doing today is going through a bit of an intro to, you know, beginners. If you don't know how to bet on football, hey, we're going to tell you how to bet on football, what the stuff actually means down the list. Today's show is sponsored by DraftKings, by the way. Play on DraftKingsSportsBook.com if you're going to be betting, if it's legal in your state. Also, smash the like button. Give your best tip for betting on football in the comment section to this video. If you're listening to the podcast, rate it five stars. Always go out of your way to do that stuff, too. And the big thing to do, as well, is in the description of the video and podcast, you get a link to FTNBets.com. You get a discount with code MAYO. One big thing you can do there is utilize all of the tools that they have at FTNBets.com, including you want to find a player prop, you type in the player, and boom, it will tell you where the best line is. That is an essential tool that really saves you a lot of time instead of having eight tabs open all at once. Joining me in the studio to break this all down, first time in the studio, yep. professional gambler, Rob Pizzola, professional math man. Uh, this- yeah, yes and no, I would say, like... <laughs> Math is a strong suit, but I, I do some like non-math stuff as well. I think that's uh, like, m- I guess a common belief is like everything I do is math based. It's not not entirely true. Well, Feinberg wanted me to ask you just right off the hop. He's just like, wow, well, to Pizzola, like you know, a half point is so big. And Jeff's like, I think they're gonna win, so I don't care. <laughs> that's the classic Jeff move. Like I I uh, I remember Jeff before the NHL playoffs. He's like, Pizzola, I don't care about the numbers. Like, I don't care what the odds are. Just tell me who you think is going to win the Stanley Cup so I can bet on them. And I was like, you know, you need this price or better. I like Tampa Bay. He's like, I don't care about the price. I just want to be on whatever side you're on. So waiting for the best odds and actual value is kind of key. That's So we're going to do beginner, intermediate, advanced throughout the course of the discussion. If you want to you know, skip what you know, a minus means in front of an odd, yep. uh, just use the time code. Yep. That's going to be easy enough. But let's start there. If you've never bet on football before and you go in, so I guess we should try to explain like what a spread is, <laughs> which is kind of crazy to think about because we've been betting on football for a long time. But just in terms of what are key numbers in terms of spread? So if people don't know a spread, you're going to see a minus seven or a plus seven. Let's say it's a touchdown difference. If you're the 49ers and you're playing, I don't know, the Rams and the 49ers are at home, they're favored. They have a minus seven. They have to win by more than seven points to cover that spread. You get it on seven. It's a push. You get your money back. If not, it's the exact opposite. If it's the plus, you get points for the plus on a money line. If you have a minus 200, in front of your team name you have to bet $200 to win $100 if you are plus 200 you can bet $100 to win $200 that's just the bare bones of what it goes down to but like if I'm going in for the first time like what should I really be cognizant of oh it's 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 very difficult so if you're going in for the first time betting NFL I'd say the most important factor for anyone is to realize that you should probably not be risking a lot amount of money on NFL. <laughs> like this is for entertainment purposes, which is fine. I bet all sorts of things for entertainment. Yeah, I, I'm an actual like entertainment based better. I'm not doing this for a living to make right. substantial amounts of money. I do it because it's fun. It's like going to a movie for me. Right. <laughs> and, and, and for sure you need to understand what you're betting. So you talked about spread bets in the NFL, which is interesting because it's a completely different market than other sports. In, in baseball or hockey, for example, you're just betting on which team's going to win the game. It's very easy to follow. In the NFL, you have all sorts of different markets that are available to you. So you can still bet who's going to win the game. Money line bet, like you mentioned, you can bet against the spread. If you want a margin of victory or team's going to win by this many points or lose by this many points. But ultimately, I think when you're betting the NFL, you, you kind of have to take a, an all-encompassing approach, right? It's uh, a mathematical style, uh, eye test. There's just a number of things that go into it. But because there's so much information available to an NFL better, I think the most important thing if you're starting to bet on the NFL is cut out the fluff. Stuff that logically doesn't make a whole lot of sense. This team is 7-1 and one in their last eight Thursday games, for example. <laughs> well, it's like those Thursday games date back to the year 1995 when <laughs> there was a completely different roster. None of these guys were playing. What does that have to do with applying it to today's game? So just applying some sort of logic and saying, this actually matters versus something that's 
I mean, it might look and sound good. This angle is 16 and 0 in the last 16 times since 1975. And it's like, well, who cares? Like it's, you're, you're looking at irrelevant data. Uh, but you can put that in the headline of an article and get people to click on it pretty easily. For sure. And I think a lot of people, you know, they, they kind of get sucked into that kind of stuff. Um, short term trends is like, is another one, right? And uh, be- because the NFL, there's a week between games for the most part, people tend to only remember what they saw last week and they forget two to three weeks ago where a team could have looked completely different. And, and one thing about the NFL is there's so much variance over a 16 game schedule, right? Anything can really happen. But if you have a, a rating for one team in your head, they're not going to play at that rating or at that skill level every single game. They're going to have good games. They're going to have ga- bad games. There's a range for these teams, right? And, and one injury can throw off the entire thing mid-game, too. For sure. And, and all that stuff needs to be factored in. So ultimately, what you want to do is you want to assemble as many data points as possible, things for you to look at on a weekly basis that you think have value. Uh, and, and that's really what you do with the NFL. Once you have that, you can start looking at it on a weekly basis, start making some some assumptions or, or, or predictions on what you think is going to happen. But it's by no means an easy game. It's a very, very difficult sport to bet on overall um, because it's a very efficient market, right? Uh, very high limits on NFL, which attracts most professional bettors. And, and a common misconception about the betting market is people are like, oh, I, you know, I'm betting against a sports book. I have to beat a sports book, which is true. I mean, ultimately you're placing your bet with a sports book and that's who's going to pay you out. But you're competing with other people in that same market. You're competing against other bettors. If somebody bets something and, and moves a line, you're in competition with them, right? So either you have to beat them to that line for the most part, and that's what I strongly recommend to beginning beginners, is try to bet earlier in the week as opposed to later in the week. A lot of people wait till Sunday morning. You do. That's where the, the lines have kind of found where they're supposed to be exactly. by Sunday morning. The problem is with football is... Injuries can occur midweek at practice, and then it throws off. It could, like if the quarterback, the quarterback is really the only position where it really matters. Right. But if all of a sudden Aaron Rodgers isn't starting for the Packers, and it's who knows at this point. But if Jordan Love ends up coming in, like that's going to be like a five, six point difference. It will be, but if I'm going to play devil's advocate on that, you could have a bet on the Packers or against them. It's going to work in your favor sometimes. It's going to work against you sometimes. That's just the reality of it. That That's sports betting. And for sure, there's a little bit more risk involved with with not knowing the exact details of the game and exactly how things are going to play out, uh, especially like December and January. Weather plays a big factor in the NFL as well. If you look at the Monday weather report, it could be very different from what actually happens on Sunday. But ultimately, it's calculated risks. And I think, ju- you know, it's going to work against you, like I said, uh, in on, on a variety of occasions. A lot of times it's going to work in your favor to get down early like that. So... What is a respectable win rate? Like, what is a professional win rate on NFL spreads and over-unders? And over-under, if people don't know, is the total points of the game. Uh, Over-under, whatever line they said, is it like 54%, 55%? Because you still have to be, no matter what sports book that you use, there's going to be juice on either side. The book is going to take anywhere from 15 to 40 cents, depending on where it is. So... Standard 10 cent VIG on a game. So meaning that if you're going to bet a spread or a total, you're paying minus 110 for the most part, you need a 52.4% win rate to break even. No one's aspiring to break even. I don't want to win 52.4% of my bets every year. Rob, I'm not going to lie to you. If I could break even, I would be doing (laughs) fantastic. Yeah, I I think a lot of people, uh, that's that's where the sports book's making their money, right? Is on the VIG because... The reality is these spreads are mostly coin flips. If Especially if you're betting on a Sunday morning, you're betting coin flips. Because like you said, we've talked about, the, the line has already been shaped and put into very appropriate range at that point. So you're flipping coins, but you're paying 10 cents to, to bet, an extra 10 cents to bet on that coin flip, right? That's why it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. For me, I mean, 55% is probably something I would target. That's if you're betting the same amount on every game, which I don't do, but a lot of people do do that. It's flat wagering. They use a a standard one unit. um, And over the course of the year, they're just trying to get more than that 52.4% win rate. For me, it's a little bit different because... I mean, if I have a bigger edge on a game, I want to bet more. More, yeah, absolutely. It's like, I I do the same thing in golf too. Like, you know, there are some weeks, I'm going to bet on golf every week because it's a part of the show. It's something that I do. But there are certain weeks where, you know, my numbers are telling me like, oh, this is just a wrong odd. I'm going to hammer this odd. Doesn't mean it's going to win. But if it wins, I want to get paid on it. But, But that's just everything in life. If you have a larger edge on something, 
why not bet more on it, right? And if, if it's small, it's like a, a you know tiny play. Why, why are you betting the same amount that you would on something that you consider to be a, a large edge? So for me, I, I never think of things in terms of the percentage win rate. Like for me, it all comes back to ROI. Um, what am I returning on my actual dollar? And that's how I set my targets personally. Uh, NFL, I think, is a is pretty hard sport to beat. If I could get a 5% ROI every single year on that, I'm happy with that because I can get a lot of money down on the NFL um, versus some other sports where I'm probably aiming for a higher ROI. Now, that's more of an advanced thing, but if we're going back to just a beginner and you're betting the NFL, it's flat units, standard, you need 52.4% to win. If you don't get that, you're not going to win because it's because of the VIG. So you should be aiming for a target higher than that. Should you ever really be betting money lines in football? For, you can. I mean, I know a lot of people who don't bet spreads at all in any sport, whether that's NBA or NFL, because they follow the same type of, uh, of, of betting style. Uh, I think the spread is kind of like invented in the NFL to make things more interesting, because if you're betting purely money lines... It, you just don't have that interest factor late in the games a lot of times because there's more games that are blowouts than baseball or hockey where it's a money line sport, but it's a lot closer. But yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm an advocate of betting wherever you think you have an edge. I don't care what market it is. I don't care if it's alternate totals, <laughs> team totals or whatever. Um, I, I don't think you have to, you know, put, you know, uphold yourself or like, I don't know what's a best word to put this but like well, this is the standard of how people bet this is how you're supposed to bet exactly and just I, just bet if if you think you can win bet on it. exactly <laughs> if you think you have an edge bet it plain and simple um especially at a recreational level like there are things that once you get to a professional level or you're really trying to to earn a, a living off this it becomes more difficult because um for example i i would have a higher edge on betting props than i would on just betting the, the spreads in the game. But props, the props limits are not the same as the overall limits. You can only bet so much on a prop in most places. Correct. And they will limit you very quickly if you're too good. Very quickly, or you could potentially just lose the account altogether. Um, that, so, that's not so much of a big deal now with the legalization yes. of sports books. Like, that's the big difference of playing somewhere like DraftKings Sportsbook versus one of these offshore sites. The offshore sites could just take your money. And you have nothing, you have no recourse for it. There, there's, a, there's a lot of things that can happen in the <laughs> sports betting industry, for sure. And, I, I, you know, if you stay with the legal books, it's regulated. They have government rules to follow. They can't just take your money. They cannot take your money. They, can, they absolutely cannot. And, um, you, you know, I, I bet, all, I bet all, all over the place. I mean, that's the reality yeah, you of shot, it. You shop for the best line. That's what, I'm, that's what it's all about for me. Um, at the end of the day, people don't realize it, but, like, Saving yourself two cents of VIG on something might not seem like a lot. Like if you're going to pay minus 108 instead of minus 110, most people are like, ah, what's the difference? Or it, it makes a difference over time. Like all these cents add up. It sounds dumb, but like you can save yourself a unit by the end of the year. And if you're betting, if you're a recreational better, you're betting $100 a game, $50 a game, you're saving yourself $50 to $100 by the end of the year just by shopping for a line. And that's, I mean maybe a conservative estimate as well. You can look all over the place. There's cases where you can middle games, right? Where you can find, uh, there's two scenarios, but there's there's arbitrage where you can actually guarantee yourself money by line shopping. You can bet one side at a price, the other side at uh, a price that are both plus yeah, money. So, so let's give an example of that. So like if you're trying to middle something or if you can just find the right thing. So Let's say we have, it's probably unlikelier in football than anything else, just because other sports will just have random odds at different places. Like I know Paul and Cody do the MMA show. MMA odds when they first open can kind of be all over the map. Same as golf odds. Like you'll see guys that are 50 points higher on a different site than on one site. So you should be betting the one that's 50 higher. But at the same time, something in football, like if you grabbed, let's say the Packers early in the week at, I don't know minus six let's yep. say and then something happens and all of a sudden later in the week they're minus one or something like yep. that like you now have a range in the middle of those two numbers where you can win two bets you can <laughs> you can you and and if only one of the two wins you 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 juice out so to speak so you you lose a little bit but yeah i mean more often it's going to happen around key numbers and uh, honestly more often it's going to happen in college football where you see a larger discrepancy of spreads especially once you get into games with higher totals um, there was actually an example of it yesterday, Texas State and SMU, um, where depending on where you bet at which sports book, there's a pretty wide range of numbers in that game. But yeah, the, the whole idea is 
and and this is an example that won't happen in real life anymore. It doesn't happen, but just for for the audience to kind of understand what I'm getting at in the middle, if if you can bet, let's take week one as an example, the Cowboys are playing the Rams. If you could get the Cowboys at minus two and a half and the Rams at plus three and a half um, at a different site, then you're cheering for the game to end uh-huh. exactly on three and you win both of your bets. And uh, I'm, I'm not saying to do this every time, but there's opportunities to do this in sport. And then there's our opportunities, like I said, if if you're if you have a catalog of different sports books that you bet at, which is what I like to do. And I like to look for the best line available. Who doesn't want to bet the best line available? But you might get Cowboys minus three plus 105 and then another book you get rams plus three plus 105 so you have the same line on both sides exactly and you plus get, money you get your plus money exactly you automatically win unless it lines exactly three and you push both bets but and then you get your money back exactly <laughs> so th- there's situ- there, there's people who've made a living out of doing stuff like that um i mean it's tar- it's, it's hard you need access to a lot of different sports books and a lot of different accounts but um, yeah, there's tons of tons of ways to bet the NFL. It's it's like it, betting in general is so intriguing. Like it's, it's a million ways you can do things. Well, that's one of the big reasons that I partnered up with uh, FTN and just their collection of sites. Just I really enjoyed. I, I'm big on tools. Like I'm gonna make my picks regardless. Like you know, people can sell me picks at some point. People can be like, oh, here's my optimizer. Here's my model of what everything's telling you. I, I'm putting down my money. I want to make my bets. You know what I mean? I don't want to have to blame someone else for that. But their tools for the site shopping are incredible. So if I want to look at that, like, Rams versus Cowboys game, just type in Rams versus Cowboys game. Here's the list of the odds everywhere. Like, that's worth getting. If it, you know, like I said, when I created uh, Fantasy National with my friend Moose, Mm -hmm. uh, the whole point was, can we take everything that's on my 21 tabs when I'm doing research for golf and just put it into one place? That's what we did. And that's what this is doing too. So for casual people, if you want to get into it and you want to site shop and find out where the best lines are, I recommend uh, ftmbets.com. You use code Mayo, get a discount on that. Traps, Mm -hmm. parlays, teasers, all this sort of stuff, fun bets to make. I I am as guilty as the next person of making a three-team, 10-point teaser. So if people don't know, uh, just very quickly, a parlay is going to be taking two or more bets and putting them all together into one bet to increase your odds. It's how you have the $10 bet that's worth $3,000. That never wins. You just lose $10 every single week, or however much you bet on it. The (laughs) teaser, you can do a different style of thing. So you can take your over-under, you can take your spread, and say, hey, I want to deduct or add six, seven, seven and a half, ten points, whatever the site allows you to do. You can even play crazy ones up to like 17 and stuff like that. Uh, But you can, so if it's minus seven and you play a seven point teaser, that team that's minus seven that would need to win by more than seven points is now a pick 'em game. The spread becomes a pick 'em, but you need three or two or however many that that site will allow you to do. But at worse odds. Yes. (laughs) For, For the most part, it's in your best interest when you're betting the NFL to stick with straight wagers. Uh, and I'll explain why, but if you're really serious about profiting on the NFL, Best to stick with straight ragers. Parlays have an appeal to people because it's a, it's essentially a lottery ticket in a lot of ways. You rarely see people putting in like two and three game parlays or more of a shoot for the moon type of thing where I'm going to put a few dollars down with an opportunity to win a lot more. $5 parlay to win a thousand, something along that nature. And that's the behavior of a typical rec- recreational better. And it's fine. Like if, if, if you're a recreational better and you're just trying to have some fun with betting the NFL and you want a big score, I, I completely get it. Uh, it, it's negative expected value in the long run, betting parlays for the most part. Uh, but it is a type of wager that is attractive for people in that sense. The same with teasers, right? The teasers. There's the, a reason they're called teasers. They are. <laughs> and l- like if, if you were to talk to most sports books, they'll probably tell you they're holding roughly 7 to 8% on the NFL. And when I'm, when I'm saying holding, that means for every $100 that somebody bets, the sports book is expecting to make 7 to $8 off of that. Straight wagers, probably a lot lower. It's probably closer to half of that, 4 to 5%, where the, the book now gets an um, increased value out of a player is those parlays, and especially teasers. Because teasers is a very mathematical thing that a lot of people don't understand how to really bet. So I can give you an, exa- an example of a good teaser versus a bad teaser. So there are key numbers in the NFL. And when I say key number, these are average margins of victory that are very common in the NFL. Three, seven. 
a lot of final scores end with a team winning by three or by seven because field goals are worth three touchdown extra point is worth seven and teams will gear their offense and going for two going for one whatever it is to get to those numbers so they can be in a part of a one score game exactly so when you are betting a teaser typically you want to move through both of those numbers to get the maximum value so for example if i have a team that's a one and a half point underdog and i tease them up six points it gets to seven and a half so now i've moved through three and i've moved through seven which are very likely outcomes in the nfl for a final score have we seen a shift in what the key number like 10 years ago i would think that more games ended on three and seven versus now when more teams are going for two earlier in the game and just having different sorts of off going on fourth downs more often than they used to that it seems like there would be fewer outcomes like that versus what they would have been 10 years ago there, i don't know if there, that's true or not. there are <laughs> um one and two used to be what were called completely dead numbers there'd be very rare that a team would win by exactly one or two but because of missed extra points now and things of that nature and more two-point conversions one and two are more in play they're worth more than they used to be so there has been a shift in what numbers are actually worth but three and seven still being worth the most uh totals as well uh 51 54 47 these are key numbers in the nfl nowadays in terms of actual totals uh, whereas they might have been different in years past just because of the way that the games were actually played out. So there has been a shift in, in that from that standpoint, but there's still basic strategy teasers um, that you can play that are positive expected value over time uh, where you would expect to, to return actual money if you were mathematically following a set of rules. Um, another mistake people make is teasing totals, right? Uh, a, a point to a, a point spread is worth a lot more than like... I see people tease, uh, you know, an over 56 down to an over 50. Those points, 51, 52, 53, uh, although they're, they're not really like, there's not a lot of value in those numbers versus a six point teaser on a spread getting a one and a half to a seven and a half or, or vice versa. Um, I know, I'm, I know I'm talking a lot here about, no, 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 no. I, I think it's good to explain this though, yeah. because like. One of the things that, uh, and this is one thing I kind of want to hammer down on too, besides teasers, like on the show each week with Jeff and Tim, we pick every game against the spread. Tim gives out his awful teasers that lose every <laughs> single week. But like, I'm not betting on all 16 games. I'm right. not playing these sorts of teasers. Like that's for part of the show. It's it's a pick show. We're making picks on every game. That's yeah. the expectation. Um, should people be betting five games they like a week should they be getting 10 games they like a week or find a game or two that you like and actually bet that this is all a matter of your preference personal preference uh for me because most of the stuff is mathematical like when when i basically i'm gonna make my number on a game and i'm gonna compare it to a book's number and then there's a formula there's a formula to determine what my edge is on that game and there's something called kelly criterion which i would honestly suggest people look into and there's tools available online if you don't understand the math behind it but kelly criterion is essentially a formula that dictates how much you should bet on that game based on what your you think your edge is um and it's it sounds like this is overly complex but even if you if you're not some sort of mathematician what i would strongly recommend everyone does at the beginning of the week make your own spreads make your spread before you look at what the actual spread is on the game then from there it's very easy to determine what your edge is, how much you should bet on that game. Unless you're bad at setting the spread. Right. So <laughs> if I could back up before that, even before you do that, what you should really do, no one's going to do this, but what you should really do is give yourself like a season of tracking um, and, and track how often the spread moves in your favor. Don't track whether you're winning or losing because there's a lot of variance over short term, but another, another um, you know, piece of jargon or, or uh, gambling term, closing line value, right? This is something that as a better, I strongly value. This All this means is um, how often am I going to get a better number than what the market is going to close at? So there's something called the efficient market hypothesis, right? And because you're allowed to bet so much money on the NFL, the, the whole idea is that the closing line one o'clock on Sunday is going to be the 50 50 line. Basically. It, that, that is the closest indicator we have to what the true probability of that game is, because at that point, all the factors in the market are known who's playing, what the weather is, 
everything you can need to know about a game by kickoff is there. And because limits are so big, professionals are betting it. And, and that's where we're settling. So as a better, I obviously have a long-term goal of winning. That's what it comes down to. How do I most effectively win or know if I'm going to win over a long period of time? Track my closing line value. How often do I get a bet at a number that ended up being better than what it closed at? If I bet a game at minus two and a half and the closing line is minus three and a half, I've done my job, plain and simple. Whether it wins or loses, I obviously want it to win. (laughs) But whether it wins or loses, I will look back on that and say that was a good bet, period. Because the market has determined that the true number on this game is minus three and a half. I bet minus two and a half. That's a lot of value. And I think what people should do is really track their bets over a period of time to see how often the market is moving with them. And if you're not getting, let's say, 70% of your bets uh, with the you know market moving in your favor, it's going to be unlikely you're going to win over time. So it's back to the drawing board and try different things. And honestly, when I was younger, I lost shit ton of money betting on sports like i was in high school university losing money regularly you get to a point where it's like why do i want to lose money anymore so i just started applying these different principles and practices to sports betting and this is what i did for many years um and i I honestly think that's the best piece of advice i could give to anyone betting the nfl is okay like you don't i'm not saying you actually don't have to bet you can just bet five dollars a game or whatever you want something that's comfortable to so that you have some skin in the game and yeah and just have for, some fun with it to have some fun with it and and but tracking is so important and people get so focused on results like it's it's there is variance in sports plain and simple if you're betting five games a week in the nfl over the course of what uh you know 16 weeks 17 weeks uh, I'm horrible with math off the top of my head, but like 80 <laughs> games a year, essentially 80 games is like eight. That's, that's nothing. It's really nothing to determine whether you're going to win. You might go 60 and 20 and it means absolutely nothing. And people have a very, very tough time believing that and recognizing that. Oh, so. you go 60 and 20 during an NFL season. You can sell your package for a hundred bucks a shot next year. That's the, that, that's the, dream <laughs> that's the, that's sig- the game, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, is it a coincidence that most of these guys that win the super contest, like they follow up the next year with an average record or all of a sudden are selling picks the next year? No, because I mean, I think a lot of these guys recognize that they probably got lucky in these situations. And there is a lot of luck involved in the NFL. You, you have to realize that. So that's why I always get back to, measuring the market rather than your wins and losses, because that will mislead you. You might go five and zero in a week and you did everything wrong. <laughs> it happens opposite. You might go zero and five. You did everything right. Um, and you just kind of got to get to that way of thinking. And it's hard because we we're all results based. Like we want to see, res- I want to log into my sports book accounts and see a nice green number, but it's the process of you you want to give yourself the best chance over time track the market track your bets my suggestion again bet as early as you can if you're not a professional because you're probably going to get better numbers uh for the most part so we've been through key numbers parlays and teasers uh do you have any sort of stance on football in terms of like round robin picks like are round robins even worse plays than parlays well it's it's the same kind of notion of a parlay so in a round robin you bet like five games, but you put in a kind of qualifier. Like if three of them win, you basically just take five games. Of like I want every variation exactly. of a three game parlay. It, it's, it's, it's just basically every combination. Um, they possible. cost more. <laughs> it costs more. Um, typically people will make them very small bets, like a dollar or two, because um, it's like a horse racing bet in a lot of ways. Like if you box in a trifecta kind of thing. Well, it's, it's a lot of people will say like, ah, oh, like I always get one wrong in my parlay. I always get cost me one. So they end up doing these round robins because then what happens if you bet a six game parlay, you're getting every single combination of twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes. Now you don't need six out of six to profit. You need four out of six to profit. Um, or kind of break even in a lot of cases. Yeah, then but if five you get, out of six, if you get a, five, you win a bunch of money. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of people like to do that. I mean, it's more of a sucker's bet. But again, like a lot of people are not betting NFL to just grind out <laughs> yeah. five units. A, like if you're a $20 better and you end up up $100 at the end of the year, that might not be doing anything for you. And that's fair. I mean, that's completely fine. Um, so a lot of people that are a $20 better might want to put that towards a round robin in a week to try to turn that into a thousand instead of a hundred. I completely get that. Like in in the long term, you're doing yourself a disservice, but 
not everyone is betting the NFL strictly to win. They're doing it for entertainment purposes too, right? And if that gets you going, like there's people who bet are in 20 fantasy pools or, or you know, put in thousands of lineups on DraftKings versus people who put in one. And it's all a matter of preference. I'm just, if I'm strictly pointing to how you're going to give yourself the best chance to win money. Not, not a good shot. It's not a good shot. I, the only, the I'm trying to, to like, I do play some of these round robins from time to time. I've been doing it a lot in UFC on actual outcomes of fights. So I'll take like eight outcomes. They're all plus money. Um, instead, that's instead of betting someone at like minus 250, mm -hmm. if you can get the actual outcome, all of a sudden it's like plus 175, plus 220. And that I would only like play like in a round of, and it's a low bet. It'd be like three bucks each on each leg of the parlay. So it ends up being like 250 bucks or something like that, depending on how many you have. But I find it plus money. It makes a little bit more sense than just doing spreads. Cause then you don't, then even if you just hit the three, you get your money back. Anything else is all pure profit. If you feel like you have an edge on that. Right. Like if you were doing money line underdogs in football rather than just spreads on it and you had like five, you had five underdogs you liked. And I would think that like week one and week 17 would probably be the best time, the only times to do that when the market really, no one really knows anything. You have guys who might not be playing in week one. People just don't have a clue. You might not know, but you have a, a, a pretty good idea or good sense of it. Uh, I, I, I like what you're saying here, and, and I think the, the key that you said about I do round robins because I think I have an edge on these bets. So the round robins in itself are not a like a horrible play every single... If you had an edge on every single one of those bets and you put it into a round robin, that's completely fine. I think what a lot of people think is that they do have an edge on these bets <laughs> and they put it in, and they really don't, and that's why it's such negative expected value over time. But for me... I mean, I probably don't have an edge. I just think I have the edge. Well, I'm I, the guy who, who's do, not tracking his process. Right. I, I would say MMA lines are probably are a lot softer than than NFL in general. Can, can you explain that to people? Because like what we said, like it's a very efficient market. Yep. Because the books are going to make or break their year on NFL, basically. Yep. So, so <laughs> typically, um, there, there's, I mean, they're they're offshore sports books, and I'll just mention them because they're they're used as the industry standard in terms of that's where you can get the most money down. So bet Chris and Pinnacle are two offshore sports books that are determined to be the sharpest sports books because they don't limit better. You can go bet whatever you want at those sites. I mean, there's a max, but you can bet that max over and over and over and over without any issue. And essentially what it comes down to here is the larger you can bet at those sites, the more efficient the market is. And, and the reason that is, is if you're a professional better and you're you have two leagues, and I'm just using this as an example, but even I'll compare, I bet NHL versus NFL. NHL, you can bet $5,000 as your max bet. NFL, you can bet $50,000 as your max bet. If you are a professional better or group, you're naturally going to gravitate towards the market where you can bet more, plain and simple, because that's, this is what people want to do. When you have an edge, you want to get down as much money as, you, as humanly possible. So because of that, sports like NFL college football, NBA, even baseball, which are, you know, take pretty hefty bets. They're a lot more efficient because most professionals are focusing on them uh, versus a market where my max bet is $200, $300, completely different. I mean, you're not going to get a lot of professional action there. Uh, and because of that, there's some less- The books don't care. Exactly. Like, I, like a WNBA line is not going to be as efficient as an NFL line. Right. So if you were actually just being like, it's just, we talk about the NFL betting. If someone's going to throw down a hundred bucks, you want to do that on football because you're watching football. It's fun to do. If you're actually trying to win money and a hundred dollars of what you were betting, you're better off finding another sport to bet on that or smaller markets within the NFL. Um, that maybe not, don't get as much attention player props. So, but, but props have those smaller limits, but props are a very beatable market. It feels like I, I totally agree with you. Historically pros don't focus so much on props because it would notoriously be what's called an account killer. Um, people, if you're a bookmaker and you notice somebody's consistently beating you on props, you're more likely to limit that player or just not want their action anymore. Whereas if you bet NFL, any bookmaker in the world is going to take you betting NFL. Same with soccer, right? You bet EPL, Champions League, you know, Serie A, La Liga, whatever. These are markets that the bookmaker is very confident that with the VIG they have built in, they're going to win money off you over the long run. Yeah, whether run. you're good or not. <laughs> now, they don't necessarily all the time. And there's people that do beat these, but there's, you know, it's a very small percentage of people. And um, that, yeah, I, I, like beginner bettors ask me all the time, like, where do I start? What should I do? And whatever. And the, the, 
naturally, they're going to jump right into the big markets right away because that's what everyone else is doing. Uh, but it's not necessarily your best route to success. And I think player props, for sure, are very beatable. Happens a lot of times. Like, you'll see on Sunday morning, a wide receiver is announced out. And they don't even update it they until don't, 20 they, minutes later. Ev- the other receivers on the team are still at the same reception totals, like bet the over. And it, it's uh, stuff like that can be picked off very easily. So that, I mean, that to me is where I would focus my efforts is is smaller markets that probably are not just getting, not getting as much focus um, as... as you know, spread in total in the NFL. And if you're someone who's only wanting to invest 20, 25, 50, a hundred dollars a week into betting football, those limits are fine for props. hundred <laughs> percent. Like limits are not a concern for over 90% of betters. Right. Um, and that's what, like a lot of people oh, like, I'll never bet at that sports book because they limited me to $500. Like, okay. Like, <laughs> but if, if you're, if you're a hundred dollar better and you're winning constantly, like you can have no issues. And, and, and that's a, a great spot for you to be betting. And, um, again, like I preach line shopping, but that happens with props as well. You'll see some massive discrepancies in props, right? Like you'll see a tight end over 29 and a half yards on one side and there'll be 40 and a half on another. That's a wide range of a middle for yardage on a tight end. Uh, where you could bet over on one site under at another. Or you might just say, like, this is a really good line relative to everyone else who's offering the same line. I should probably bet this. There are people who make money with doing absolutely no work themselves other than line shopping and saying 90% of the sports books are offering Rob Gronkowski at 40 and a half yards. And this other sports book is offering 55 and a half. I'm going to just bet the under because they're clearly quote unquote off market. And there are people who do this. Like it takes no skill other than just being able to look. Um, and, and it's a, it's a path to success for bet for a recreational better or even a beginner. Um, I'm not even gonna, joking with you. I've had my wife do this before for me. She knows absolutely nothing about sports. She doesn't watch sports with me. She'll maybe my sit wife, down. My wife is the same way. She yeah. has, she has no interest in what I do professionally. I will say this about Diana, bless her heart. I mean, we we started dating in high school. When I first started dating her, I'm like, I don't care if it's your dad's birthday on a Sunday during NFL season. I don't care what it is. Like, I'm not coming. I'm not showing up. She said, fine. I don't understand why you love the sport so much, but whatever. I get it. And now, like, she'll watch NFL Red Zone with me every Sunday, and she's totally into it. Like, what are we cheering for? What are the bets here? She puts in some of her own player props by doing line shopping, so she's got a vest- vested interest. It's it's actually great. But for the most part, she knows nothing about sports, um, and I kind of got her into, like, line shopping for the most part, and it interested her. And she, like I said, like, I'm, I'm confident that my wife could beat NFL props, knowing nothing. It's not, it's not as hard as people make it out to to, to be, but it's ultimately, I think a lot of people just get focused on the wrong things. Uh, there are some books that will let you parlay player props. Yes. Uh, as long as they're not from the same game, they keep a lot of, so a lot of places won't let you do correlated props right? Uh, or correlated bets in general. Like you can't bet a money line on one team and take the, the minus two and a half to, it has to be one or the other. Then you can do that with the over under if you want to, but some places will allow the player prop parlays. So that's that would be a fun round robin if you think that's a super beatable market and then you could actually enhance your player prop total off that way for sure i mean uh there's all th- sorts of things you can do you can probably still find a few correlated items that you can probably still bet on it's very rare nowadays i remember when i was growing up you used to be able to parlay soccer draws <laughs> with the under two and a half <laughs> which was like okay like complete correlate like massive edge and then that got figured out and never happened again, but you can still find stuff like that. Like, um, if you strongly believe for exact, you know, some books will actually let you parlay, uh, like wide receiver totals from the same game. Like if you like over receptions on, I don't know, Odell uh, Beckham, then you like the under on Jarvis Landry. Exactly. Uh, things of that nature. Most places do not allow you to do that. There, mo- you can't, it, it's hard to find stuff like that now, but, um, potentially, I'm trying to think of, there was a few last year off the top of my head that I think had, uh, there, there was a factor of, but you, you can still find stuff like that. It's just not uh, the edges that they once were, where it was like, 
completely obvious that like if this outcome happens, the other is very likely to happen as well. And they don't allow that anymore. Um, just with all the competition going on right now in the United States for to acquire customers, because yeah. that's really what's going on. Like I saw that DraftKings Sportsbook for like week one has like these insane giveaways, like make your first bet here and you can have Chiefs plus 100 points on Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's a guaranteed winner. It's a great way to keep money in your account so that you're betting for the next week as well. Like, they're smart. I mean, sportsbooks are smart. They know how to acquire customers. They know how to retain them. Um, ultimately, for me, like, I think the recreational better is just looking to to feel like they're not being cheated, so to speak. Give me a lot of markets to bet on. Like, if you're a rec better, you want to bet on as many things as you possibly can when it comes to the NFL. And I think a lot of the, uh, the sites everywhere now are doing that well and also it's just like pay me out when i win don't cancel my bets if it's a line error stuff like that and uh but yeah i, I love the week one offers like the guaranteed winner i'm uh, oh man there's so many of them out there now um which is great i mean you should bet them and you can get some money to, to yeah play it's it it's legitimately free money it, 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 <laughs> it is free money um but it's it's a great uh tool for the sports books to get you to to try their book and get you to you know have a good first time experience there and uh and hope that you'll stick around so some of the other things and when you mentioned line shopping like i said when i uh, paired up with ftmbets.com promo code mayo for a discount um that's like the main thing that i really want to utilize i mean they they let me use it for free <laughs> but uh, like i said i can just type it in and be like oh where is the best line value i yep. don't i don't need to just be like oh, i need to click on here and here on this site then here and here on this site and like scroll back and forth maybe shrink the windows down i'm not a multi-screen type guy yep. when it comes to my computer so i have to make the boxes a little bit smaller line them up next to each other now i don't have to do that you 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 got one screen for your computer yeah wow. i mean not those computers obviously yeah. but behind there i have a four monitor setup and it's sometimes not enough for me like it's i i'm like but i have uh an it like i have i have problems <laughs> i have like serious problems <laughs> like my neck is sore all day from turning and like looking around and i i constantly tweak my setups to like vertical monitor versus horizontal it's it's a disaster what do you use the vertical for um email usually really yeah so it looks like a phone yeah it's more uh i don't know I don't know. I don't know if it, it's better that way or worse. It's just kind of, <laughs> just it, it's what like fit, it. if it's what fits my setup now, but uh, I, I, uh, that's like the, the toughest thing for me to do. Like if, if I go to a, a cottage, this happens like I have a buddy of mine, a close friend of mine has got a cottage up North and probably a couple times over the course of the fall and the winter, we're going to go to that cottage. And I just end up there with my laptop and I, I like want to cut myself just <laughs> like how, how does any, how did I ever do this for so long? Um, it's horrible. I, I need the, I need the multi-screen experience. I see. I watching football. I need the multi-screens, but just my day-to-day -day life. I can just do the one. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Maybe that's just, I'm conditioned that way. Yeah. I'm I, not even old, but that's just how I'm conditioned. Well, it's, it's because uh, have you, have you tried the multi-screen experience before? Like has your home setup ever been multi-screen? No, it okay. hasn't. See, like once you do that, well, there's only, no going back. Only so, at the office has it ever been that way. Okay. So yeah. like doing actual production stuff. Yes editing yeah doing the show i need the multi-screens but just for me being on the internet i don't once you change that at home it's it's over for you yeah so don't do that all right my, my wife would probably <laughs> absolutely hate that so let's jump on to like kind of the next thing um line movement and reverse line movement mm -hmm. is that a myth yes. like that people just look into and be like it's a cool is it one of these things that you talked about at the top like the logic behind it is this just something they talk themselves into it's like oh there's an edge here yes so there's there's a lot of of myths in the nfl and this is the challenge uh at, for a recreational better is seeking out content that is not bs so not mine uh, I don't know, but uh, mine's, I, I guess, mine's pretty BS. Okay. It's, it's me and Feinberg yelling at each other about Feinberg's the big fan of the Miami Dolphins have won every home game at 1 p.m. I, I know Feinberg's <laughs> tricks when it comes to the NFL and what con <laughs> content he likes to seek out. I'll, I'll keep that secret or whatever, but it's, uh, yeah, okay, I, I get it. But like reverse line movement and public bet percentages, right? This is this is a big thing nowadays that's being pushed. Well, it's just it's, it's easy to make content around it for one thing. And that's that's the whole point about all of this stuff is that old school bettors would have these old school trends that they would use in like the 80s because that was the only information like you had available to you. 
And then that just somehow got baked into now because it's easy to click on. It's easy. It's fun to talk about. Right. Like whether it's true or not, I have no idea. Well, okay. We talk about the eighties, right? We didn't have the internet. <laughs> like if you bet a line at minus four in the morning, it stayed that way. Like the entire day, it was whatever line was in the newspaper. Right. I mean, it didn't account for injury. Like if I was born in the eighties, I'd be like, I'd own an island right now and like a gold Bet, rocket betting ship. Betting in the 80s. Yeah, be, sorry, betting. I was born in the 80s. If I was betting in the 80s. If I was born two de- decades earlier, maybe one decade earlier. Um, so it's very different than now. It's much harder to win on sports betting now than it was before. A lot of it is because of the misinformation that's out there. So one of the co- most common things, my friends do this all the time. I, I do it too. And I'm trying to explain this to, I want to be on the same side as the book. Like what the Look at Vegas books, right? They're making they're making money every month on the NFL. Like, how do I just be on the same side as them? I'm going to make money as well. Well, here's the difference, right? Somebody's betting on the NFL. The book is charging a VIG. This is why they are making money. They're not letting you bet plus 100 on every single game. You're betting minus one. Yeah, they're, they're not winning because they've called the game, right? They're betting because people are betting both sides and they're just taking a cut. Right. So Houston KC, the first game of the year on Thursday hypothetical, let's say 80% of the people are betting on Kansas City. The sports book is obviously cheering for Houston, but they've charged people a premium to bet on Kansas City. Now, all of a sudden, someone's like, I want to be on the same side as the book. They're going to bet Houston. They're laying minus 110 to be on the same side as the book. It's not apples to apples. And this is like people, I don't know when this became a thing and how it has not been corrected in this market right now, but the whole contrarian betting thing is is false for the most part it's just it's not a way you should bet on sports and it, even if you're on a quote unquote square side or a, a side that the public likes that should not stop you from making that bet maybe you should look into why it is that you're on that side or may, potentially whether you think you're overvaluing or undervaluing a specific team but do not let the public percentages stop you in the nfl is one well thing. can we even trust those like, because they get reported by all these different books. Here's the public bet percentage. Here's the amount of handle we have on each side. Like, I would think that any legal sports book would have to put out real numbers if they were going to advertise that sort of thing. But most people are going to places where they're not legal sports books to look at this information. So they could just be making shit up. They could be. I, I will say, I, I don't think... I don't think the stuff is made up. I personally don't. I just don't see the... the there's no value. There's no value in making this stuff up. It would be more of a headache for someone to send made up lines regularly or uh, percentages regularly than to act, you know, to send actual numbers. But overall, like, it doesn't give you any context into anything either, right? Like these Houston bets, how many of them um, were at a certain number? That makes a difference, like makes a very big difference. If I'm betting Houston at plus 10 versus plus nine and a half, I want to know... What percentage of the bets were at? I might want to know, and and it's it's not broken down that way. Well, it would just be, it would just give you at least some context to these numbers, exactly. Instead of just here are bets on Houston, right? So what reverse line movement is is basically one side gets all the money. Yet generally speaking, the way that people understand it is that if let's say someone is at minus, the Cowboys are at minus three everyone bets on the Cowboys. Then that line will theoretically move to minus three and a half or minus four. But there are certain situations throughout the course of the week where the line will start at minus three. Everyone will bet the minus three side, but for some reason it goes to minus two and a half or minus two. So that- Why is that? So that means there's more money on the other side. Sportsbooks are adjusting not based off of the percentage of bets. They're adjusting based off of money. Also, they're adjusting- when you bet with a sports book, they're profiling you in some capacity. That doesn't mean they're going to limit you or whatever, but they know if Pat Mayo is going to win and what sport he's going to win on. And now all of a sudden, you're, you're a winning golf better. You put in a golf bet. They take my bet more seriously than they would someone else's. Exactly, which is logical, right? I mean, you're a sports book. You're trying to set what you think is the truest probability of a game. You're going to use the information that's available to you. Um, and that makes total logical sense. So what reverse line movement is, is exactly like you said, the line moves in the opposite direction from where the majority of the public money is right now. The problem with reverse line movement is you're waiting for the line to move before betting. So why this is completely wrong and why no one should ever use this strategy is because as a better, once again, your goal should be to get the best possible number. You should be anticipating the way the line is going to move, betting it, 
and then getting a good number. If you are waiting for pros to take a line from three to two and a half, and now it's going to close at two and a half, what good is it for you to bet that two and a half just to be on the same side as a pro? Because yeah, they bet it at the three. They bet it at three. <laughs> so now you're betting it at a worse number just to be on the same side. And I can guarantee you the majority of those pros aren't betting it at two and a half or else they would keep doing it and the line would keep moving. Like they filled the position that they wanted, plain and simple. And now you're ch- it's essentially chasing a position and you're doing yourself a disservice. So like the re- reverse line movement, contrarian betting, it's garbage, man. It's really... I, I don't know how else to put it. It is absolute garbage. Uh, you're, you're just really, really doing yourself a disservice. In terms of live betting, do you do much live betting or no? Uh, I'm, I do more and more of it every single year because there's a larger edge to live betting than there is to pregame betting. So I found this in golf a lot of the times, and it doesn't always result in winners, but it's almost like you said before, where if you can say what the number is and you can bet the better number and eventually the line just moves to whatever number that you had originally pegged it at golf markets in general are very slow to update if it's not the very premier players in the world so all of a sudden there's a guy who's one stroke off the lead and they're hanging at 100 to one on him when he should be like 10 to one yep just because you bet him at 100 to one doesn't mean he's going to win nope. he'd still be rightfully 10 to one which is a 10 percent chance mm-hmm. and the odds are never fair anyway so the actual value is probably like six percent chance of winning but you got a huge number on it to make that worth your while in football do you see that hack because it seems like they're a bit sharper in football everywhere is it is and it isn't but like the thing they're they're the algorithms for live odds right now for football are probably not as sophisticated like they're getting better every year but there's still elements that are not accounted for in a live game um one, momentum well <laughs> momentum that's a, that's a, i love that one um it's, it's still hard, though, as a sports... Like, even though, though I'm a numbers guy, you still kind of feel the momentum. And well, like, you're, you're watching it. It was like in the Super Bowl. Like, once Kansas City started making their charge, like, one... They need one element of good luck here, and they're going to win this game. And they got it. And they did. They won the yeah. game. Um, with sports, so... Uh, sorry, with the NFL and live betting, there's still, I think, some inefficiencies, so to speak. Like, um, what I love to do is... the the pace of play early on in a game uh, and betting live totals. So I noticed this very early in the year last year, but Arizona was running a lot of uh, no huddle offense. Um, Whereas the pregame line was no, no one really knew they were going to run so much no huddle to start the year. Now all of a sudden they have a couple series and you're like, this team is playing very fast and the live line is not being adjusted for how fast they are playing. Uh, So I was betting some live totals on overs and stuff like that. And I still think you can find some inefficiencies like that. I think if you were to ask any sports book right now, they're holding much less on live than they are on pregame. Um, that means like I talked about the hold off the top of the show here, but an average sports book, probably seven to eight percent hold on NFL. I'd say it's half that if most on live betting, uh, just because there are these inefficiencies that people will, will watch a game and they'll look at the line and be like, it's, it's not adding up. This doesn't make sense. This algorithm that they're using to set this line is missing something. Um, so if, if I were new to sports betting and new to betting NFL, I'd be much, much more interested in live markets right now than I would in pregame. Uh, just because I think they're beatable, at least more beatable. I, I, I full wholeheartedly believe that. Yeah. Hmm, That's interesting. In terms of like, uh, we, we talked a little bit about if you feel like you have an edge on certain games, you bet those games. But in terms of like, if you want to keep money in your bank account, Mm -hmm. which when people talk about bankroll management and things like that, I think they don't quite understand what that actually means. Like if my bankroll, cause I have a hundred dollars on a site, my bankroll is not a hundred bucks. Like I'll lose the hundred bucks and deposit another hundred bucks. That's fine. Mm-hmm. So my bankroll is actually what I'm actually willing to, to me, at least the way that I use it for myself. What am I actually willing to lose here yep. on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis, on a game, And what amount am I okay with losing? Because like I said, it's entertainment for me. I don't want to be losing $10,000 on a game. Wouldn't feel too good about that. If it was a hundred, I don't feel good about it, but like I can live with that. And it was worth the fun of the game to go through and maybe I could win. Where do you see people have, I mean, people do develop problems with this stuff. Uh, 1-800-GAMBLER, if you feel like you are one of those people and you should seriously look into this because I have friends that this has become a problem for. Most, no, it's fun for most people. And we know a few people too that just like off the deep end with this stuff because they can't. And a lot of it just has to do with simple bankroll management stuff. Like 
if they're riding a heater, they start betting more. Like, not a great strategy to take. Like, if you have a bankroll, and let's say it's $1,000 for all of the NFL season, in your week one bet, you're betting one game on week one. How much feasibly should you bet? Like 25 bucks? It's, it, so again, this is totally- It's on you. It's totally a matter of personal preference. I'll go back to what, what I use personally. I don't expect that a average better will use Kelly Criterion, but to me, it's something that people should look into because it's a very easy way to effectively manage your bankroll. It's very, it's very, and like I said, you don't have to know how to do the math. You can find lots of sites where this is the number I make the game. This is what the book's number is. Tell me how much to bet. I wouldn't use a full, I, I use a fraction of Kelly and I know we're getting more complex here. And yeah, I, but that's, that's how the show is supposed yeah. to progress from intro to more right. sophisticated. So like I, if you're using full Ke- like Kelly criterion, it's very risky strategy. Um, I, I take a, a smaller fraction of it. So I use a quarter Kelly. So I'll, I'll and you can build this into the uh, into these these sites as well. Uh, it's very easy to follow, but that to me is a very effective way to manage your bankroll, plain and simple. Um, the most effective. It's like it, I, I see some people who are very good. I mean, better than most. Like they would be if you looked at their actual like bets. Yes, they would win more than they lose. Yet they have no money left. I, the, a lot of people just don't know how to like, but that's, I think a really essential part to all for, of this. For sure. And there, there's a lot of things that go into it as well. Right. So I, I could say to you that an average bet for me is probably one to 2% of my bankroll. That that's probably pretty much an average bet. That's what I would recommend, but it completely changes for someone who has five bets in a day versus someone who has 500 bets in a day. Like, it, like the, the Marencian cam of just betting 30 things on the board you have to allocate your money a little bit. If you're betting one to two percent of your bankroll on 30 games a day, then you have 30 to 60 percent of your bankroll and play on a daily basis. Now, all of a sudden, you have a bad day and you're done, right? So, um, you have to adjust based off of your volume, plain and simple. Um, like this is common sense, right? But, but like, one of the things that I see is like someone will win one game, uh, and they'll win like three games in a row. So, then in the fourth game, they bet like five times what they were betting before, and then they just lose. I could, I could tell you all the, all the mistakes, right? <laughs> I keep, mean, well, let's, like, hear, let's like, hear the well, mistakes. Like, hot and cold streaks don't exist. They're not, they are a figment of people's imagination. They think, like, when you're on a hot streak or you're on a cold streak, are you doing anything differently with your betting? I, w- I was wearing the same underwear. Like, I was eating this in the morning. Like, most people <laughs> have the same way of handicapping games regularly. Um, like they're not changing their approach for the most part. That's just like, that's just fact. I'm not saying every single person is like that, but for the most part, an NFL better is going to get into a routine of what they like to do to make their NFL bets. And that's not going to change over the course of a year. Now, all of a sudden they go five and oh, and they think like, oh, like I'm hot and like, I'm seeing the board. Like, I love when people I'm, see, uh, you know, I'm seeing things differently. I, I do feel that way though. Like, I, I'm not I, saying it's right. It is wrong. But you do feel sometimes like when golf first started back up out of like the break, like I, I would look at my like the six guys that I bet that week, they all finish inside the top 20. And it happened like two weeks in a row. Like, I'm, I'm feeling it right now. Of course. And then next week, it got completely wiped out. I know. <laughs> I, I, and, and it's just because of variance. Like it's it's five games, like five games, 10 games, even 20 games. I've had stretches where I've I probably have had stretches before where I've won 20 games in a row. I, I'm, I assume I have. I, have you I, gone the other way too? I probably have. Like um, December last year for hockey was one of the worst months I've ever had in my life betting any sport. Now, like it's important to take a step back and try to understand why that happened. I got very unlucky based off closing line value, expected goals, lots of overtime and shootout losses, which are just coin flips. And, you know, if you, if you go one and 12 on coin flips, I mean, there's nothing you can really do, right? But um, for the most part, like, there's, there's a propensity to, I'm hot, I'm going to bet more. There's the the opposite where it's like, I'm cold, but like, I can't keep losing like this forever. So I'm going to start risking more on my bets <laughs> Which now. Which is actually the single worst thing. It's oh. like the guy, it's it was like my friend's strategy in Blackjack. Oh, the Martin Gale. Yeah, I just, yeah. well, I've lost the first three hands. So I'm going to start doubling my bet to win it all back. And then he's just out the door because he's lost every hand. Of course, because there's going to be a certain stretch of all these coin flips where you could lose 10 in a row, 15 in a row, 20 in a row. And if you hit that point, you're, you're totally screwed. So um, yeah, I mean, I think sports betting is tough because first you have to have the picks that are going to win. Then you That's have the to, hard part. Then you have to be able to bet them properly. 
Um, and I, I think you're completely right. There's a lot of people who do themselves a disservice in betting, or they just feel like, oh, you know, like, I, 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 here's another one of my person, my, my friends, uh, they, I love my friends, but they make me die of laughter, right? So like a guy will be up $240 at the end of the week, and he'll be like, you know, I got $40 extra. I'm just going to put it into like this massive parlay or whatever. And he's losing every single week, whatever he's off of a, of a flat hundred dollar. Yeah. So if he was up 240 bucks and he's donating the $40 back, like he's, you like, do that every week. He's giving five away, weeks or giving away 20% you know, of your winnings. It's, <laughs> So I, 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 and I'm guilty of doing the exact same thing too. And a lot I, of people are, everyone, it's tough. It, you have to condition yourself not to do this. And some of the reasons that I don't do some of this stuff anymore, cause I did all this stuff and I lost my money and I was like, well, this is stupid. What am I? And it's, you take the step back. It's like, what am I doing wrong here? And if you do track your bets and you look at it and it's like, if, if you're on DK sports, you can just go to the settings. You can see your transactions. You can see all of your bets. Like, why am I making this bet? Why am I making this bet now? Sometimes, like, especially during live golf, you know, I'll take three or four shots. It's all very, that's why I like betting golf, because it's all very low stakes to win a lot. Like, yep. if you like betting parlays and you want to do it in football, just bet golf instead. Yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a decent strategy or anything where you can have some, where uh, a $10 like bet can pay market. A yeah. That's not outrageous. Right. Or, um, I mean, you could do that on the NFL when you just bet an updated Super Bowl winner every week based off what you've seen something like that by the end of the year you have a bunch of small bets to win a large amount you may not win them all you may i mean you there's a lot them all. yeah you could lose them all it happens but like there, there's it no uh you know every sports better is different there are i have friends that they know they're going to lose money on sports but they're and they okay don't care with it. because you know what if 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 my you know a close buddy of mine will be like i have a thousand dollars a year that i know i'm going to lose betting on the nfl but for me it's it's entertainment. It's a thousand dollars that like, if, if I, if I'm betting $50 a week, I could go to the movies. Well, I mean, you can't with COVID now, but no, I, but, but that, that's exactly how I look at it. And like 50 bucks a week in order to go to the movies, I got my wife, me, yeah. concessions, parking, the tickets. We have two kids got to pay for a baby. So that's like a $200 night out. And you know what, Pat, I, I'm totally fine. Like if, if that's your entertainment, and you have like an entertainment budget and you're spending it on sports betting and that's enhancing the experience for you and you're getting entertainment value out of that, I'm totally fine with it, right? Uh, but when, when we're drawing a distinction between a rec better and when, someone who wants to win, you, 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 you can't do those things. You can't do those. Like <laughs> you, you have to treat it like, like it's an investment portfolio. I mean, I, I, I know a lot of professional sports betters that view that they'll call their picks investments. That's, I, that's, that's, that's really pretentious. It, it is, but it, but but if you view it that way, and they and it's very likely because they do view it that way. It's not like, as they should. Yeah, but like just, I invested just this much like. dollar, this much into this this week, or I invested, and, and that's a, it is just a different version of a market, right? It's no. Oh, different. it's the exact same thing as like when you talk to like DraftKings pros who are not betting; they're playing on DraftKings yeah. fantasy wise. Like here's my portfolio of players through my 150 lineups. I have. 48% of my lineups invested in Patrick Mahomes this week uh, and the Kansas exactly. City Chiefs stack kind of thing. Yeah. And that's how they view it, likely why they're successful at it. Yeah, it, I, I think and so. And it's an easy way to organize too. And organization is key to a lot of this stuff, I would think. For sure. I mean, uh, I, I couldn't tell you of someone that I know that wins that's not like doing, I don't want to say extreme, but like they have a pretty good version of tracking going on where they, they know exactly what they've invested, what the ROI is on that, um, what they're really strong at, what what they're not. I mean, another great thing about tracking, and depends on how granular you get with it, but like you'll, you'll notice that if you're betting, you know, you have all these bets tracked, hundreds and hundreds of games, you'll find patterns where you might be off. Like maybe I'm negative ROI on betting on home teams, for example. I'm just throwing out a random example. Maybe I'm, I have too much home field advantage baked into my numbers, um, something like that, right? Yeah, I, I would even think too, like if you are using a model to parse out all this information that there could be circumstances if you look back at the past five years where, hey, weeks one to four, it's really good. Weeks five to 12, it's not very good. But at the end of the year, it gets really good again because it doesn't interpret the middle of the season data right once numbers have actually piled up. I would think that's something that happens to a lot of people or vice versa. Uh, it, for sure, it does. Like uh, my volumes, my volume on NFL betting in weeks one to five or six is much higher. In, compared to the rest of the year. Why is that? Because we don't ha really have any data to work with other than what happened last year. Uh, so there's a lot of opposition amongst sharp bettors. This is another thing that's actually, uh, sharps are on this side. 
yeah, maybe some of them are. There's a lot of sharps that are on the other side as well. Like this is what drives me absolutely bananas about like the sharp betting reporting and whatever. Most of them are betting numbers, right? So you can have a Baltimore, Cleveland week one, sharps bet Cleveland plus seven and a half. It brings it down to seven. I'll bet you there's a bunch of sharp bettors that are now betting Baltimore minus seven, but always gets reported on one side or the other. Sharps are on the Browns. Sharps are on this. Drives me insane. But the reality is, especially early in the NFL year, there's more disagreement amongst professional bettors because there's not a lot of data to work with or not a lot to go off of. By week six or seven in the NFL, even week eight, you, people have got the same numbers. Everybody's using the same data. Everyone's kind of applying logic to it in the same way. There might be some subtle differences, but for the most part, you're not seeing a whole lot of disagreement at that point. So for me, early in the year, numbers tend to be a lot softer, or at least uh, I view it that way, where I can accumulate more. I've probably bet ha half the NFL board for week one already. Uh, I, I think I have a, uh, a play in at least eight of the games right now, if I'm thinking off the top of my head. And in some, I've bet side and total. Whereas I can tell you, second half of the season, I, I, I likely will not have eight plays in, in any week. So Yeah, just limit it as the season goes along. Well, the numbers would obviously become sharper. Like, that's why I like betting. I mean, it could be completely fool's gold. It's another one of these things, but it's just something that I've observed over the years. You can find two or three massive upsets. Week one, week 17. Just because the numbers are completely off. Because you don't really know. Right. Now, who is it going to be? I couldn't tell you. But they happen every year. Of course. <laughs> well, what, what tends to happen in week 17 every year, I will say, is that um, the public, public money can influence. And this is another thing, right? People are like, ah, you know, like public money doesn't really influence anything. It's all only sharp bettors. But if, if everybody is betting the same side, the sportsbook's going to move. Like they're not going to keep the same number up there so that everybody can keep betting the same number. They're going to they're gonna react to that. And, the, and that really depends on volume. I think the greatest example of this ever happening was the Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather exactly. fight. Where somehow the public decided we're going to bet on Conor McGregor. Yep. And all of these like little $20, $50, $100 bets, there were just so many of them that everyone who was smart just bet Floyd at like minus 310 exactly. instead of minus 38 million. But the line <laughs> still moved towards McGregor because there, like you said, there was such an influx of, of public money on that side that the sharp money could not really offset, outweigh, offset that. And and in a lot of cases, like that's, that's a good example, but sports books built up quite a liability on um, Mayweather. Again, or sorry, they wanted Mayweather to win, obviously. So that and he was going to win. He was <laughs> going to win, but sportsbooks well, have board of directors. Like, yeah, yeah it's, it's a, it's it's a also business, boxing. right? Like, it's, it's a punch. They're trying to limit their risk as well, so they'll move in that nature. But like week seventeen every year, the the need to win factor doesn't exist. Like if you historically look at teams to that need to win in week seventeen. They underperform relative to market expectations, likely because there's so much pressure on those players, to be completely honest, whereas the other team is very loose. I mean, that could be narrative driven, but I'm, I'm looking for a rationale to explain why it happens. Yeah, looking for the logic to explain why these results actually right, happen. But, but no one wants to bet on a team that's three and 12 going into the final week <laughs> of the season against another team that needs to win to get into the playoffs. And the reality is what ends up happening is these numbers get inflated because everyone is just backing like every single public better in week 17 is backing the team that needs to win and it creates value on the other side and it's funny because you think people would learn their lesson on that uh especially in this region because i know a lot of people are bills fans around here i feel like this has happened to the bills like twice in the past 15 years where they needed to win week 17 to get into the playoffs playing some team that was playing a backup quarterback because they had nothing to play for or they were already clinched and they just outright lost the game i don't i don't know what it is with sports betters I'm not like a, a you know psychologist or anything, and I I, I haven't studied like the human mind. Uh, but do you not have a minor in psychology from Western like Feinberg does, which he enjoys to reference? I do not. <laughs> I didn't actually know that, which actually makes makes it quite funny. But um, <laughs> I, I I I don't really understand the human mind. But I bet you, if you were to poll sports betters on whether they win or lose, probably half of them would actually believe that they win. On sports betting. See, I, I, my thought on it is I always feel like I'm going to lose sports betting. So I already have it baked in that I'm going to lose. And I always remember the bad hits more than the good hits. Everyone does. Do they, though? 
Because if people think that they're lifetime winners, they would. Th- I would imagine they would think about like if you think you're a winner and you're clearly not a winner when it comes to sports betting, you would have to be the person that remembers the good ones, not the bad ones. It's. I, I don't know. I, I think there's like a an inherent ego when it comes to a sports fan where everyone wants to believe they know better than everyone else. Uh, and they convince them. It's almost like they're constantly selling themselves on the fact that they they know what they're talking about. It's really hard to explain, but like, I don't think a lot of people live in reality. <laughs> and maybe it's because they don't track well enough, or they, there's like a number of factors that they're, they're, that lead them to this opinion. Um, may, maybe they are winning the majority of their bets, but they're losing money because they don't know how to stake themselves properly and things of that nature. But for the most part, I find that like. I'm, and maybe it's just because I'm so in tune with sports betting Twitter or gambling Twitter, as I not, call it. Not overly representative of the general public. Right. But I feel like people just naturally think that that they win at sports when in reality, we know for a fact that like 99% of people don't. Uh, and I don't know what it is about it, but... Um, well, a lot of the people that you're seeing, especially in gambling Twitter, are also trying to like sell things to go along with it. That is true. Th- that's why I like to sell the tools. Like, I, I don't like, so like, you'll never find any of my picks behind a paywall because they're not good. They're for entertainment pers- purposes only. But if you have access to, like, if you play on DraftKings, you want a lineup generator for golf, you go to Fantasy National, has all the stats there, you put your inputs, then you don't have to create an Excel sheet and track all the stuff yourself. You pay five or seven bucks a week, it does it for you. I, I appreciate your, <laughs> like... My hustle to shill? No, 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 not your... Well, that's fun. It's funny that... I, it's, you're pretty good at it. You, you do like work it in there nicely. It's good. But I, appre- like, I appreciate the tools component of it, right? Like I ran a pick selling site service for one year. Um, Seems like it'd be stressful. I was doing a lot of media at the time. That was more of the stressful thing in terms of like just trying to get the, the brand out there. But for the most part, I really, really tried hard to not make it a site that is just here is your pick, go and bet it. It was very much centered around use the tools. Like I'd put the predictions up on site and people could input their own lines so that they could see if there was still an edge on a game or something like that. The va- like the vast majority of people were like, just give, give me, me the picks. Give me the damn pick. And and to educate people on like, I, I like the Cowboys at minus three but I don't like them at minus three and a half. Can you explain why that is though? Cause they, again, that, that comes back to the very first thing I, we said on the show is like Feinberg doesn't, he wanted me specifically to ask you that. Why is that? Because you, you come up with a number on every game of what you think that the actual value on that game is worth. And the difference between a three and a three and a half is substantial in the NFL. But it doesn't sound like much. It does not. It's not the same as the difference between a 17 and a 17 and a half. Not every half point is created equally because we talk about key numbers in the NFL, right? And that's why everything tends to converge towards threes and sevens in the NFL. You very rarely see a bookmaker come off of those numbers unless there's a lot of money. Unless they're shoved. Correct. Um, what, about, was, what about like buying a half point or a point? Is that just never do that? It's like taking insurance and blackjack? It's so bad. Oh my <laughs> God, it's so bad. And you're, you're, you're just being charged more than the point is actually worth. <laughs> like, and people do it for peace of mind. Like, oh, man, I, I, I could never live with myself if, if they lost by exactly four and I didn't buy up from three and a half to four. It's like, okay. <laughs> like, I, I, there, there's, there's just so many things. Obviously, you could tell that I'm bothered by a lot of things. In no, the NFL, the, the, but, but I think this is what we need to get out here. But, the, but, the more information, because a lot of people, especially because we're both in Canada, we've been sports betting for a very long time. In America, there's the people that have been betting for a long time, know all of this stuff, or the people that are just getting into like, this is really the first, last year was like the first year gambling was legalized in states. This is going to be the first year where a lot of people make that plunge because it's in more states, and maybe they didn't do it last year. It was very close to the beginning of the NFL season. This feels like the first full ramp up. There's commercials everywhere that they're going to get into it. They have no fucking idea what they're doing. Yep. (laughs) And I mean... I will say this about key numbers in the NFL. There's actually good content online around key numbers. So like if you search for this stuff, you can find it easily. Some people have an unwilling list to learn or they don't care or whatever. But like this is this is another pet peeve of mine. It drives me crazy. I already saw this one week on Twitter. That's why I bring it up as an example. But somebody saying that um, they're going to, it's Charger, no, who's it? Uh, Colts, Jaguars, week one in the in the NFL. The Colts right now are a seven and a half point favorite on the road, roughly plus 100. 
and someone's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for a minus seven here. Like, don't, I, I want to take the Colts, but I'm waiting for minus seven. But if you get minus seven, it would now be minus 120. Well, probably. here's the thing. <laughs> a lot of people don't understand what that point is worth, right? So minus seven and a half plus 100 could, is better than a minus seven minus 125. But people are so, like, they've convinced, oh, seven's a key number. Like, th- there's no concept of what these points are actually worth. That's what separates the better betters. The better betters. The better betters from the inexperienced ones that are probably going to lose over the course of time is the is the concept of value. Um, I tell this to people all the time. I've told this to Gioff. Gioff <laughs> does not understand what I mean when I say this, and and I'm not picking on him, but like... Oh, you can pick on Jeff on this. There is a number at which I will take any team in any game. If the value is right. That's why I strongly suggest making your own numbers before looking at a sportsbook's numbers, but... You want to talk about what gets people into trouble in the NFL. They'll watch a game. Team- would, would you be even better off trying to make next week's line before the first week? Like in for my week two, if I was to do this, would I be better off making week two lines right now? Because I don't have that bias of what happens in week one. Or do I need to see week you one? You need to see. So week one has to play a factor. Okay, so let's say it's week four and week five every previous week still has to play a factor. What tends to happen is people overvalue the previous week itself, or they look again at their very results based. So a team will win in a blowout. They'll win by two touchdowns, but statistically speaking, they probably should have only won the game by three points instead of 14. That will play a factor. But I hear this all the time. I watch football with my friends. I cannot wait to fade the Rams next week. I can't wait to fade this team next week. I can't wait to bet this team next week. It's like, how can you say that when you don't know the line? You don't know (laughs) what you're betting. Like, I I never understand that. Uh, Usually when you talk about like, you know, if you don't want to fall into the trap of reverse line movement or contrarian plays, that's probably the contrarian play. Like when you say like, don't be on the square side or the public side is just sit around with your friends. And if four of them who are like not good betters, I'll agree on one thing. Actually just go bet the other side. I'll bring it back to last year as well. Like, Ever, the Packers are a fraud. Like the pa- the Packers, and they last, were a fraud. The Packers were a fraud. But I, here's what I'm going to explain. They finished 13 and three. They they had they should have finished as like a seven and nine team or eight and eight team based on their underlying metrics. But everyone's like, I'm fading the Packers next week. Like th- this team is a fraud. This team is. But that got built into the line. They're being priced as an eight and eight team. They're not being priced as a 13 and three team. So people are are fading them with no value on the other side. Like there were some games that were like. I, I mean, this is what I'm trying to get into, right? It, it's more so like you, you you really have to put a number on things in sports. This is the best piece of advice I can give you if you are sports better. It doesn't matter what market, doesn't matter what sport, try to make your own number before you bet. And I, I guarantee- And look. And honestly, if you're willing to, try to track it over a longer period of time before you bet- some people won't, or just bet minimal stakes at first to get, you know, so you have some skin in the game or whatever. But well, that also not only starting out with very small stakes, whether it's dollar bet, 50 cent bet, whatever it is, at least then you get accustomed to how to find things on the site and putting in, like, if you ever do want to get into a circumstance where you're going to up your bet at all, being familiar with DraftKings Sportsbook and knowing where to find everything on that site. Be like, oh, well, where are the player props? Like, can I find these in a pinch if news hits and I have to go jump in? You want to have that experience of being on the site. Like, for me up here, like, I don't have access to DraftKings Sportsbook. So we have all the sites that we're able to use. There are some sites I'm just better at finding stuff on. And I tend to gravitate towards those sites for me. Right. In a pinch. Like, if something like live betting on golf, like, I know, and I know the difference between the books of this, this site is slow on this sport. Or just like this, this site loves underdogs. They will give you an extra half point on an underdog. Exactly, and 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 actually, that's a great point because it's it's a great skill set to have, uh, especially when you're trying to look for a line in a pitch pinch, doing line shopping. You know, certain sites are going to uh, shade towards an underdog or shade towards a favorite. There's all sorts of things that are built into that, and and I, I agree with you. I mean, like there are advantages to actually placing the bets rather than just tracking. Um, a lot of people track like. It's good it, and it's fine and you should, but there are, there are certain inherent advantages to, do, to doing stuff like that. But ultimately, it, to me, it always just comes back to, to value, right? I, 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 like get out of the mindset of betting on teams and start betting on numbers. And it's really hard for people to understand that, but you will be a, 
better off in the long run if you get out of that mindset. There has to be a point where you will bet either side in a game. And if there isn't, then you're doing things wrong. And and I would stand by that 100%. Like, there's no room for me to compromise and say, oh, like, you're doing things wrong if there is not a number where you would bet either side in a game. Rob Pozzola, thanks for coming in, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Anything else you want to impart to the people if they're doing wrong or doing right? Uh, let's see. I, uh, think we, I think we touched on most of it here. Yeah, I, th- I think... Like, Getting on NFL is fun, by the way. I'll leave. I'll drive home in the car in like five minutes. I'll be like, oh, man, I should have brought this well, up. Where, where can people follow you so you can tweet those out at them? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. My name, at Rob Pizzola. I have nothing to promote. Uh, I, I still love using Twitter just because, like, I'm not... Does I'm, it make you mad at the same time, though? You see the people, what they say, and you, you want to get into it. Remember when the Texas Rangers fans hated you? Oh, I've had a lot of fan bases. Hate. Texas Rangers, Kansas City Royals, New York Islanders, they've laid off a little bit because I've kind of come around on their team or said some nice things about their team lately. Um, football, Oakland Raiders, uh, Las Vegas Raiders now. But there, I, I, I've had, like, I've gone in with, with some fan bases. Now, like, back in the day, I would I would get into it. Like, I would spend hours. It would... <laughs> Now I love the mute mute function on Twitter. Like I just never have to see some people's comments ever again. Like you you got like a uh, you got one chance with me on Twitter. Oh, me too. You tweet <laughs> something stupid, mute. I'll let you follow because I want the followers. But <laughs> you need you, the clout. <laughs> but I will never I will never see your comment again. Every once in a while, maybe I'm too quick to it, and I'll get a DM. I have open DMs on Twitter. I'll get a DM from someone like, "Hey, you never respond to my tweets," and I'll look in and I'll. I'll check the history of why why I muted them. I'm like, okay, I was probably pretty harsh on this guy the first time around, but I have no patience for that stuff. I love the mute function, but I still do love Twitter. Like Instagram, Snapchat, like the- new- Yeah, but you're an information-based person exactly. and Twitter is the information yes, app. Yes, yes. It's not the, it's the least pleasant app by far. Yeah, I would say Instagram you're right. never makes you feel bad about yourself. It does. Twitter imp- does. <laughs> I feel like I have to work so hard on Instagram. Like I don't know. I'm for, I'm not a visual person for the most part. Um, I don't really care to inform people of like what's happening in my life. For a while. I went for like a nice hike yesterday. My wife's very much like taking pictures. I don't really care. Like I just like to be doing my thing, right, and living my life. Um, and I find like I don't know if you find this on Snapchat or Instagram. I don't have Snapchat. I've never been on Snapchat. Okay, I I, I rarely use it. Instagram more often, but like, I, I find like I have to put so much effort into the stories. Like it bothers oh, me. I, I don't even use the stories. I did. I do like, <laughs> I used to, I, I don't know when the last time I did one, but like, it's just so much work and effort. And I find myself like deleting stuff all the time. Whereas Twitter, it's just like this popped into my head. I'm going to tweet it, whatever. And it's, it's great. Yeah, and I find that Twitter is much better for marketing purposes, too. If I need people to watch the show, I can just kind of schedule, fire off a bunch of scheduled tweets, be like, hey, in case you missed the show. Not if you're a tout. If you're a tout in the sports space, I've noticed this on Instagram recently, but like Twitter, it's it's a lot different, but like Instagram, you can really get away with like a lot of deleting of old posts and stuff like, you can really sell yourself. Oh, as, as, a, you, as you're never wrong. As a winner. <laughs> and I cannot believe... I thought like the tout followings on Twitter were big. And a lot of these people will be like, how does this guy have 50K followers? Like you, you could tell by literally five tweets that this person does not win. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a natural skill of mine, by the way, is like immediately being able to tell whether someone wins or not. I'd financially back that with my own money on whether that person <laughs> wins or not. But Instagram, like some of the followings are absurd. I can only imagine what some of these scammers are raking in. On, on Instagram. Maybe that's the way to end it is that's why I like selling the tools. Like you can buy picks. Like some people give out good picks. And like, if you're a person who's just, I want the picks, you could find someone who's really good. And I think teaching people along with those bets, like you were talking about, I think is a, that's actually something to pay for along with the tools, but the tools, you know, you can adjust them to whatever you want. Of course. And I, I that, that's why I, like I, I appreciate what you're doing in terms of a tool service rather than a pick service. Pick service services do a lot of injustice to the better themselves for a number of reasons. One, a lot of the people don't win, but they're able to sell themselves as winners. So already you're buying negative expected value picks and you're paying a fee on top of it. Like this is a, this is a the trouble with with for pick buyers is it's already so hard to win at sports. Now you add in a fee on top of your bets. Like you're making it exponentially harder for yourself, but also like a lot of people are just buying stale lines. Like if I buy, 
if a tote releases a pick on a game and his pick is Dallas minus three. And now it's minus four. What does that mean? What does that mean? And in my opinion, the tote should no longer be selling that pick at that point because it's not of value, but uh, at the end, it's all about pick sales for them. Yeah, no. So one of the things that one, another one of the main reasons that I did go with uh, FTN bets is like, they have like a discord chat for people who, you know, they purchased the tools and if there's bets to go around, like the, the people who are, working with the site are in the chat being like, hey, what do you think of this line? Well, now that the line has moved, it's X, Y, and Z, that kind of thing. Like, I think that is really important. And having like timestamps on stuff too. Like not everyone's Vegas Dave. No, no, I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the scammer of all scammers right there. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's tough. I'm, I'm not saying there's no totes that, that don't win. No, but selling but information rather than just strictly selling picks, I think actually has value. I, Where if it's just, here's a sheet, like I release my golf betting cheat sheet every single week on Twitter. Yep. Like, no, no one should ever pay for my betting cheat sheet. Yep. If I start selling bets, you know, I'm in a hard financial spot. Put it that way. <laughs> and no yeah. one should ever buy them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, like, like I said, I've been down that path before. It wasn't like, it's, it's just very, uh, it, it put, really puts things into perspective of how the average sports better thinks. Like I said, it's, it's just, it's sad to see. It's like, I don't care what the line is now. Just give me the pick. Give me the, Who give me the pick. Bet? And it's like, I bet the Yankees at minus 120. It's minus 150 now. Do not bet it. Like here is a tool for you to put in your own lines, but I want to be on the same sides I would, as when you release the picks. And it's like, well, you're not. Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> and, um, and, and that's like, even the most, the, the touts that do win, you have such a limited opportunity to bet the same price as they do because as soon as they post their picks or release them, there are some that have actually influenced the market because they win. They're good. So other people have recognized the fact that this person's a long-term winner. They've released a bunch of picks. Everyone's going to bet them right away. And guess what happens? Lines move and again, you get no value out of it. Yeah, that's why having like an open Discord chat and like being in that while you're actually watching something. I know this happens with Cody and Paul on the MMA show. Like they are really good at live betting UFC. Yep. But that market is available for like 30 seconds. And you have to actually make your bet first before... Of course. You, and you, you, have have to, to, you have to wait usually for a trader to approve it for yeah. like 10, 15 seconds. And, and sometimes even by the time that you can punch that in, like it's gone. I completely. I used to tweet out some uh, live bets and people are asking me like, why don't you do it anymore? And it's like, because it's a hassle. And then people bet the wrong stuff. Like I gave out a Sergio one at Heritage, uh, right when golf came back, it was 251. And, like all the outliers kind of pointed to him doing well. That line was gone within six minutes. That's the problem. Like NBA second half. So like the difference between betting a minus two and a half and a minus three on a second half of an NBA game, that's a big difference. Like these points matter. This is people don't realize it, right? Again, this I, we'll, we'll end on this, but like, bet on numbers. <laughs> that, and that's your not thesis. <laughs> teams, like it's it's really hard for people to understand that. But everything you should you do, you should create a number beforehand. And I'm not saying you need to run some sophisticated mathematical model. There's a lot of handicappers that will arrive at very similar numbers to me without a model. But they're they're they have the experience of doing it, knowing what numbers are, and they they know what to value, right? Like that's the, that's the thing, right? I, okay, maybe they're they're not running like fifty thousand simulations of a game to determine what the actual probability of each team is, but there's data that goes into those simulations, right? I, I, and if somebody else is working with the same data set and knows how to apply it to sport, they might know what to look for. Um, and, and that's like, that's the whole thing. There's different ways to win. Is this why you see so many like former financial, like bankers, financial investors just get it? Like they're predominantly the people who are doing this stuff. That's a good question. Like you, I saw a lot of them it, come over, like whether it was like the poker boom, those people got into it. And then at the very beginning of like DraftKings, when that exploded, it was a lot of like ex financial guys. I think it's just because they already have the, the base that's needed to do that. Like to be, to be a good sports modeler. Like if you are going, yeah, if you're going to model sports, you need to have a good statistical base for one, and you probably need to be a good programmer. Yeah, at, you have at, to at know the how to do this stuff. At the very worst, you need to be extremely skilled with Excel, but that's probably not going to get you that far nowadays. Like you need to have either some knowledge of Python or R or something like that. Um, so, I have no idea. So that yeah, so is. the entry level for a basic, for an average person, I shouldn't say basic, but for like an average person that doesn't know this stuff, it, it just seems so overwhelming, but it's actually not that hard to do like an intro to stats or intro to coding and, and 
develop the skills that are required. Just not a lot of people don't people don't have the time. They don't want to do it. They and don't. That, know and that's where get and them. that's where some of these services do come in handy. Is right. That it's available for you for Correct. ten bucks a week or something. Correct. Correct. So I mean. Th- what are you willing to pay so you don't have to learn this? <laughs> yeah, so you don't have to do it yourself, and and that's completely fine. But for me, I, I'm big on uh, people get into arguments about this all the time. Like, you need to bet on sports this way. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do that. You need and to bet on any way that you can win. You, exactly. <laughs> There's so many different ways to win at sports. I'll tell you this. If you're looking at just trends and you're like a trend-based better, you're very likely not going to win. Like, I feel very confident. You're not, you're not using something that's of value in, you're looking at backwards looking items. A lot of them don't apply and you're trying to make them forward looking. That's not going to be as successful for you. But there are people that I know that like, I would not necessarily say are smart or intelligent people or have like the statistical background, com- computer science background, but they know how to apply data to sports. They know what to look for. They know some, this metric is valuable. I need to incorporate this in my handicapping. And they could, like I said, could arrive at very, very similar projections to someone who is very statistical, like has a very good, solid statistical background. Well, you you do it for golf as well. Like I would think that something just on a very basic example, if people understand golf, is that in your factoring and trying to determine what's value and what's not, something like strokes gained approach would be very high versus strokes gained putting. Yes, for the <laughs> most part. Yes. Um, but But I mean... Even professionals will have disagreements on things or skilled people have dis- disagreements on, uh, like, like for example, um, data golf does a good job of, of, and, uh, Musonomics as well. You guys, fantasynational.com slash Mayo for the yes, discount <laughs> have, um, course histories, what, what metrics are valued at specific courses and things of that nature. And I, I've actually checked out both that doesn't necessarily mean that the course is going to play, play exactly the same. And that's where, like, for me, I feel So like is it irrelevant, or do you have to fact... Like, if you're doing one of these modeling things, and whether it's for PGA, whether it's for NFL, like, if it's something that you can't quantify how valuable it is or isn't, do you then just have to throw it out? There are weeks I won't bet golf because I'm not confident in how the course is going to play. So I'm, I, I believe in, the, especially a lot of, of courses where we have no data on them in the past before. I can read a lot of, about a course. And there's been times where I've called courses before to find out how the course is playing over the course of that week. Um, these are things that I feel like I have to do because that, to me, as long as I'm able to have an accurate representation of, of how I think that course is going to play, I think I'm going to be fine. I think I have an edge. But that's not always the case. So you do well with the heritage every year, yeah. like I do too. Yeah, I mean, there are certain courses like just gambling wise, I do really well at, and it's usually a course that's been in the same rotation with the same sort of field every year for the past forty years. What um, what course? It was probably the fourth or fifth week uh, back from COVID where they played the same course twice in a row. Oh, uh, Mirfield Village. Mirfield. The first week did not play at all like it did in the past because it was set up completely differently. And then the next week it did, and it did. And people, like, I think a lot of people were lost in those two weeks. I, I, it's like, funny, I was and I wasn't. I actually did really well the first week and bad the second week. Okay, I see. I, I, I had two good weeks in a row there. I was on a good run of things, not a hot streak. You, you're on, you're riding the heater? Things were, things were working out because I put myself in a position for them to work out. But, um, well, if you're, I mean, it just based on the modeling, I, you know who models love? Colin Morikawa. Mm-hmm. And they have for the past 12 months. I bet Morikawa. And it, fi- to, to and it, and it yeah. finally, yep. It finally paid off. Yep. It did. I mean, pretty consistent golfer. I, I think, uh, typically when you're model, like his struggles are short game, short game and putting and so, putting is especially like over the course of four rounds, it's a lot easier to get hot with a putter than it is to get hot with your irons if you're not good at hitting irons. Exactly. Hey, what did he do in the, his two wins? He putted well. Exactly. And he did everything else the same. Exactly. <laughs> so that's typically why I have more focus on other metrics than uh, than strokes game putting. But yeah, I mean, like the reality is it's just important in sports betting to be able to first off know what data to look at. But like most people are using the same data regardless, but it's it's how to apply it. That's that's where I think I have the biggest edge, right? Is I, I feel like I'm I can take a data set, you know, if you put a thousand a thousand people in a room and give them all the same data set and give them a problem, I feel very strongly in my ability to problem solve and 
figure out how to apply that data set to, to the problem itself. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. And that's like one thing in the NFL with trends. Trends to me is that's data that you have to work with. It's just bad data. It's just useless. <laughs> like, what are you going to do with that, right? And some people solely look at that. Are there certain things, like I talk about, like strokes and approach I always find is a very good predictor. It's the most important thing you can do in golf. People always forget when Tiger was lapping the field and everyone in 2000. Why? He was getting more than a stroke around with his irons than anyone else. That's why it wasn't close. If you have to make an eight-foot putt, even if you're a bad putter, you're going to make a whole lot more of those than if you're putting from 25 feet every time. So now... I, we've evolved into golf, which is fine. I, I don't care. But, like, but is there a football equivalent of like other two or three things? Like you talked about pace earlier. Yep. Like there's a pace tool up on FTN uh, now too, which I really enjoy. And it gets updated either for full season and you can shrink your ranges and make it customizable. Well, versus like, you now, did they change quarterbacks? How does the pace play with this quarterback? Or if they have this running back in the game, are they more likely to pass and go more up tempo and just different types of yep. splits like that? But I find that pace tools are actually one thing that you can really look at for over-unders at least. And you said the in-game is probably even better because yep. you can watch that in real time. Absolutely. And, and like there, there are elements for me that are not um, strictly like automated, mathematical. I, I project personally, this is my own work that I do, how much I think a team's going to run or pass the ball in certain situations. That goes into my model. It's completely subjective. But I think I do that really well um, relative to some other people. And it's why I end up high or low on some, certain teams because I don't think that they are necessarily making the right play calls in the right situations. And that hurts them. And that hurts them. Or it helps them if they're really good at, at doing that. Um, so I, that, that's kind of stuff that factors in for me. Like, I, I will bring it back to golf just because I think strokes gained approach is a good example or just all metrics, but it's like, do you look at the past four rounds, the past 48 rounds, That's the past calendar year? How do you wait years? So you could like, if you do have a, a programming background, it makes it a little bit easier because you can test that sort of stuff. Right. And that's why I think you're at an inherent advantage, but I don't think it's the only way to win. Um, and it's just the way that I like to do things because you can go back and say like, historically the last 16 rounds a player plays are the best predictor of strokes gained approach for future rounds or some, I'm just throwing random yeah. numbers out there. But like, well, but, and like when I try to go into it in person, I'll go to fantasy national. I'll look at the like past eight rounds, past, past 12 rounds to see if there's any sort of trend. Like, is this player getting better? Yep. And then I'll go back and just kind of click on their player card. And I, then I can look at past, Two years, past three years, past one year, past 50 rounds, past 100 rounds. Like, are they baseline any good at this? Right. Has anything changed with them? And, you, and like, that's really hard to figure out in golf because you'll see two or three players every year who are, like, complete dog shit. Yep. And they figure it out their game. Or, exactly. Or, or be like Spieth and just be the opposite. I, I'm very in tune with the golf media. I watch I, I watch a lot of golf content because it fascinates me, and I, I like to get And the, it's all over the place. It is. It's great, though, because it was the first sport back post-COVID, so everybody started doing it, but... I, I like the different, the unique perspectives, right? And I'll hear things like, this person is like really good with his irons. Look at him this week. And it's like, well, all that was pre-COVID. He's actually been horrible since he's come like back. Leish Mark Leishman is a perfect example, right? And for me, like Jason Day sucked pre-COVID and then he came back and he's great. And, he's great. and like, you, you know, it, people who are modeling Bryson, how do you model Bryson? Like for me, I just dismissed everything pre-COVID because it's a completely different golfer. It's not the same golfer, right? He's hitting the ball 80 yards longer off the tee. Like it's and, absurd. And it's fucked him up. He's going to figure it out, but I, we'll see if he does or not. I right? think he will. He, I, th I think he'll scale back on the, he's going to be really good at any course where rough isn't penal. Yeah. Like the masters is such a perfect course for him. Cause I, he just bombs away. Just, I, I, of course, uh, in, I, I think I tend to agree with you. I think he'll figure it out. I, I'm kind of just biased because I've started to dislike him a no, little bit. No, you can't. No, don't be like the P. Don't be like the sheep. I don't care if I bet on him and whatever. I, I, I'm not Bryson's a Bryson's great. I formulate Bryson's my own awesome. opinions. I, I think he's I think he's an ass. But <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it's there. there's millions of ways to to bet on sports. There's, there's tons of stuff you can do, but it's... Um, I like your idea of applying logic to everything. Does this logically make any sense? Like you said, some of these trends, they don't. You got your notepad here where, you know, you write things down over the course of the show, probably for post-production or whatever. Yeah. For me, I actually have a notepad when I watch NFL, right? And I look into, uh, and it's not really NFL, it's pretty much everything, but it's like, I kind of make notes of items that I may not be accounting for or things that are changing that I have to look into after the fact. A lot of times you can't do that in the middle of the season because it's just too much work to do, but like it's items that I tackle in the off season. 
Um, like I have a running, uh, like a running diary on my one screen laptop yeah. uh, about every course. Like at what are, what were my opinions of this course from like the past three years? And I have enough of a sample because I've been doing this for a while and just what has changed for me after these, what did I notice at this course that was different or just what are my unfiltered opinions about how it actually played? It doesn't match up with everything else. Like these sorts of players played well. Well, right. why was that? I can go back and look into that in the off season, but did that correlate with what happened at this course the past three years? Right. Did it, if it does, that's great. That's, it, that's a tournament that I feel good about for next year. Yep. I mean, there's, 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 there's so many ways. How does weather factor into this in NFL? Uh, depends. So like depends. wind, it's wind, wind, wind. And typically strong winds. Uh, nowadays, what's, most, what's quote unquote a strong wind? I would say any, anything upwards of 20 miles an hour is going to have an impact. And that's not to say anything like upwards of 10 will have a minor impact. And then you start getting into 20. Um, you tend to see people with like, you tend to see the market react pretty quickly to the to weather conditions nowadays, especially late in the year. Like if it's going to be a windy game, totals coming down. Yeah, but can you kind of spin that in your direction too? Like I find that snow games tend to go either way. Like those could be super high scoring games. So snow games actually tend to favor the over a little bit more. But so people will always bet the under. Because it depends on the wind as well. Like snow and wind is different than just snow. Like that so, Buffalo game against the Buffalo against the Colts in the snow where they ended up running the pick play, not getting the two-point conversion, the Bills right. ended up winning. That was a very low-scoring game where you couldn't pass. But I also remember the, I think it was Jets, no, it was Eagles, Jets maybe from a few years back, and McCoy just went nuts in that game, and the, he rushed for like 300 yards. The the level of snow is going to matter. Like, it, and breaking, breaking down weather is important in any sport, to be completely honest. But it's like, really hard to do. It is tough. I, uh, um, and, and how can you rely on weather reports? You, can, you can't in a lot of cases, but... Weather reports are like, uh, or forecasts are just like sports betting prob like it's probability of what's going to happen. Yeah, but now you're factoring in one probability versus another probability. Like I would think that indoor games, and maybe you want to inherit that variance because you know, you've seen that it yep. tends to favor one side versus another, then it actually affects the number. But I would think like dome games, you're giving a set of circumstances that just aren't going to change. Yep. Unless you're the Falcons pumping in like crowd noise. Or you change your turf or something like that, which does actually have an impact on things. Could be faster, could be slower for players. But uh, th there's a number of things. But like snow, for example, is um, when, you're, when you're a receiver running a route. You know where you're going. Exactly. When you're a defender, you don't. <laughs> so now all of a sudden you're playing in snow no wind conditions, so it's still operating as normal other than maybe the quarterback is a cold hand, but, I mean, he's warming it up on the sidelines and whatever. It's it tough. feels like it would favor the offense. It does in a lot of cases. So um, there there are certainly, I think, edges that come with um, uh, weather. And I, I, I think that, historically speaking, in the NFL, you look at games that where there's huge line movement, especially on totals. It's always coming in games where there's severe weather conditions. Um so, yeah, I mean, th there's an edge to be had there. If you can get down on it earlier, it's good. Uh, if you're waiting till the last minute on Sunday morning because you're seeing the weather report and it's going to be really windy and snowy, I can guarantee you that the, the number's already been moved uh, because someone anticipated that already. That's the challenge. Ah, getting ahead of the game. Yep. Finding that right value. Number, make your own numbers, find your own values, and you'll at least have a better chance of not losing all of your money during the NFL season. Hope you enjoy the chat. You can follow me on Twitter at the PME. Like the episode, smash that like. And in the comment section, leave your best betting tip for the NFL season. Play on DraftKingsSportsBook.com and take advantage of one of those giant free money offers, basically, that are up there right now to get in the game for week one. Also, sub to the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast. Fresh content coming at you every single day. It's a lot of work, but I enjoy doing it. Thank you all for watching. I'm Pat Mayo. I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo Experience! Experience!